Hey, welcome everyone to Church Bar Vista. Uh, my name's Glenn Deeds. I'm one of the elders here at church, if you have forgotten. Uh, we also have these blue slips. Uh, if you are new to church, please fill those in. What's that, Nathan? Ah, oh, you're right. They probably don't need that bit. Maybe the prayer needs. I think that's probably still relevant. Um, you can always do prayer needs, maybe not on a blue slip, but you can uh, email in and uh, the team will work on those. It's always good to know that there are people listening to your prayers. Uh, not just God, but the, all the people of the church are also um, able to help you. What I wanted to do as we kick, uh, kick off the service this way today was um, just talk a little bit about what we should be doing while we're in isolation. Um, I hope you're catching up with your workmates, catching up with your friends, catching up with your family members. They are the easy ones, I think, but uh, the other part that's a little bit hard is to actually catch up with ourselves and actually watch where we're at in our own um, personal time and personal reflection. Something that I noticed in Morgan's testimony last week that prompted me to look at was uh, Ecclesiastes. He mentioned that was one of his uh, favourite books. Just at the end of Ecclesiastes, they have a really good warning, and I think it's really relevant to us in our personal walks at this time. It says here, right at the end, uh, Ecclesiastes ver chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, it says, here is my final conclusion, fear God, and obey his commands for this is the duty of every person god will judge us for everything we do including every secret thing whether good or bad so that's, i think it's just a warning for us at this time to actually watch ourselves and watch our own uh, walks you know, we're also in isolation and so we've got a, a role of personal accountability at this time so let's just think about that as we uh, worship god please now join us as uh, we sing rejoice
Good morning, Church at Paravista. This is Emma Boschel reporting to you live from Church at Paravista. Now I've had some breaking news come in and what we've found out is that due to the cancellation of K-Shop, there have been many leaders bouncing around with residual energy and this has resulted in a new song and dance track from the K-Shop team. So we're gonna cross over into the field. All right, roll the tape, thanks.
That was wonderful. Now we might recap the memory verse that we learnt last week. I know it's been helping me during these discouraging times, knowing not to be afraid because the Lord is the one who goes before us. So let's have a sing of that now. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord is the one hey, who goes before you. He will be with you, never fail nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8. Hey! Thanks for watching everyone. This has been Emma Boshu for Paravista News. We'll see you next time. We're gonna cross live. Roll the chair. Good morning, church. This is Paravista News and I'm Emma Boshu reporting from the scene. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> A dragon. A dragon. What am I reporting from? The building. <laughs> the studio. Okay. Yeah, which is not what this right. is. Is that how it goes? Is that how it goes, Sams? I don't know if that's what you uh, had to do just then, but thanks for that, Sams, for that uh, update and that encouraging um, words and, and moves for the kids. Uh, we're now going to go into a time of prayer. So what I want to do here is actually start with Psalm 119. I'm just going to read uh, verses 1 to 16. And I'd really like to take out of this the encouragement that we can receive from God's word at this time. It says, Happy are people of integrity who follow the law of the Lord. Happy are those who obey his decrees and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil and they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your principles. Then I will not be disgraced when I compare my life with your commands. When I learn your righteous laws, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your principles. Please don't give up on me. And verse 9 in particular. How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word and following its rules. I have tried my best to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your principles. I have recited aloud all the laws you have given us. I have rejoiced in your decrees as much as in riches. I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. I will delight in your principles and not forget your word. So many times King Solomon here reminds us that we have so many uh, things that we need to um, ponder upon. So many things in the in the God's word that uh, are there to actually remind us to stay on track and, and uh, keep the path that God has in store for us. Uh, that's what we need to ponder upon here. So let's just pray. Father God, thank you for being with us. As your word says here, Lord, there are so many decrees and so many law, uh, laws and, and uh, guidances, Father, that we can seek and find in your word, Lord, that we can put into practice uh, if we are to just follow them and, and uh, we will be in a better position, Lord. So at this time, Father, we just pray that we can continue to do that. We can, uh, if concerned and if worried in any way, Lord, we can seek out your word. We can seek your will through through your word and your spirit and uh, um, that we can accept that guidance that you give us Lord every day so we just ask this in Jesus name all right as uh, we move on I'll uh, now pray for Nathan as he comes up to uh, share with us today father Lord God just uh, pray for Nathan pray that you would um, give him the words to say father Give him uh, the, uh, the guidance that we need to hear, Lord. And uh, may we have receptive ears, Father, to hear that and, uh, and work on those issues that come to mind. So we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, thanks, Glenn, for that, uh, that prayer and that encouragement from Psalm 119. It's always wonderful to be reminded of uh, what the impact of God's word uh, should be in our hearts and in our lives. And I also add my uh, good mornings to you all uh, and welcome to our service. Uh, last week we, uh, we started a new sermon series and it was titled Walking Worthy. And throughout this week I've been uh, thinking a little bit more about the topic of what it means to walk. You know, what does, you know, I guess the physical act of walking mean? Uh, you know, what in today's world, um, this physical act of walking is, is not just a pastime, not just a uh, mode from getting from A to B. But I reckon the last two or three years has become an absolute passion. And you, you may say to me, well, well, how so? I'll ask you a question. How many of you monitor your daily steps? Who among you uses some uh, form of app or you might even have a, a, a Fitbit on your wrist or a Garmin or, or some other device that monitors your, your, your stepping performance? And I guess in the last few weeks as we've seen uh, gyms shut and uh, fit places of fitness sort of shut down, you would have noticed a, a complete increase in uh, foot traffic around the streets and the parks and wherever that may be. You see, doctors have told us that it's good for us to, to walk and we seem to have this real interest in how many steps we, we do day by day, week by week. It was suggested by doctors that 10,000 steps a day is a good goal. If you manage 10,000 steps a day, it will boost your heart health physically, it will strengthen your lungs, it will improve your concentration, it will strengthen your bones, it will build muscle, it will stabilize your blood sugar, it can even help lower your blood sugar and blood pressure, improve your flexibility, boost your energy levels unless you're going up some incline that's too steep for you, and it can even improve your mood. Evidently, there are the 10, 10 things that walking 10,000 steps a day will help with. But what do you got to do to realize those benefits? What must you do? What must you do? Well, you can't really be a passive participant, can you? If you set this goal of, of 10,000 steps, um, you need to actually measure your progress. You, you actually need to get off the couch. You can't tie your Fitbit to your dog and send your dog off for a walk and, uh, and claim the benefits. And uh, so you're not passive in that sense. You need to put on your shoes, you need to work out the track, and you need to, to walk those steps. You see, when it comes to, to our walk of faith, and that's what this series is about, it's about a, a walk of faith which leads us in a, in a process of sanctification. It too is not a passive pursuit. It's not a passive process. Last week as we started to unpack Ephesians 2.10 which says this, For we are his workmanship, God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You see, God is describing there the process of sanctification, the process of growing in Christ-likeness. And as you unpack this verse, you see it is both a passive thing and an active thing. You see, God provides the empowerment, he provides the plan, and he provides the grace to walk in good works. How does he do that? Through the empowering of his spirit and into the believer's heart. So if you like, that's the, the passive component of, of walking. However, you and I, those who claim to be followers of Christ, we need to be disciplined in following the commands of Christ. 
We need to be faithful and obedient. We need to read and understand God's word and, and see what he has for us in his word to follow. And that's an active pursuit. You see, the Christian life is not a let go and let God type of life. You may have heard those terms before. Because throughout Scripture, we're never encouraged to let go and let God. The Bible never promises an, an easy, automatic victory over sin and temptation. It's God empowering us through his Spirit. And it's you and I being active in following his commands, reading his word, what we call being disciplined in, this, in the things of spiritual nature, prayer, meditation, Bible reading, being daily convicted by the claims of God's word. As we, we go through Ephesians 4 and 5 and into Colossians, we'll see the repeated exhortation and the commands to press on to walk in a manner worthy of our calling in the power of the Spirit. So it's a balance. Yes, God is passive. He provides his Spirit. And yet we are called to be active in the process of walking in a manner that's worthy. So let's look at um, Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read uh, these six verses together. And then just unpack this a little bit, because as we go through this series, we, we're now turning the corner into the practical application of what it means uh, to walk for our Lord. What it means, if you like, to be an ambassador of Christ on this earth. So let's read together these uh, six verses. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling, to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Yeah, so we come to a, a part in this letter, and it's like a, a doorway from the classroom of knowledge to the workshop of experience. And most of Paul's letters contain such a hinge moment in them. One of the most classic ones is Romans. For the first 11 chapters of Romans, then you bump into Romans chapter 12 and you have the same type of exhortation. I urge you, therefore, brothers, to present yourselves to God. The same thing here in Ephesians. He, he comes to this hinge point, a point where there is a shift from principle to practice, a shift from doctrine to to responsibility. From the indicative, i.e. what God has done for you, to the imperative, i.e. my response to what God has done for me in his marvellous grace. Ephesians 4.1 represents such a point, such a hidden point. For, you see, for the first three chapters, uh, Paul has reinforced the truths that he had taught to these believers. Remember, Paul is not unknown to the church at Ephesus. He was the church planter. He was their pastor for two plus years. He taught daily in the school of Tyrannius and, and taught them the truth of the gospel. You can find that story in Acts 19 and it's wonderful to see the impact that Paul had upon Ephesus. Ephesus, I would consider, was the megachurch of ancient um, Asia Minor. 
Timothy served there. John served there, we believed. Paul served there. It became a place that was theologically sound. But they still needed to be reminded of their calling. They needed to be reminded of what their new life in Christ entailed and what it would look like. So, you know, for the first three chapters, um, Paul's explained to them again and again the wonders of salvation. He has, he has outlined the key truths of the Christian faith. Why? Because as you and I become more deeply acquainted with the truths of the gospel, with the truths of salvation, and what God has done for us, this will motivate you and this will stir you into action. See, when you contemplate what God has done, I'm sure you, you sense an overwhelming love in your heart for the amazing grace he has shown you. And when you have that type of response, this will determine your motivation for walking according to his plans. You see, it's never the other way around. If you're motivated in your walk by just keeping a list of rules and a, and a way to try and please God, you have misunderstood grace. There's nothing that you and I can do that can please God except for placing our faith and trust in Christ. It says grace that saves us, and as we read last week in Ephesians 2.10, it says grace that continues to sanctify us. I see, this is a key thing here. It's a key point that Paul wants to make. He's moving from a body of truth about salvation to the practical outflowing which comes from understanding and living in the light of that truth. So what are some of the truths that he is thinking about? And if you've taken up the Ephesians challenge, and I hope some of you have, remember the challenge is to, to read this letter 20 times. And to write it out, I've had some wonderful uh, calls through the week of people saying, hey, I'm, I'm already uh, written through to chapter 3 and I'm enjoying reading it. Well, as you're, as you're reading through this book, and I challenge you to continue with the challenge, you'll understand that in the first three chapters, these are the things that are described in relation to salvation. We are chosen by the Father. We are redeemed by the Son, and we are sealed. Our salvation is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Salvation is also a gift of God's marvelous grace. And this results in the fact that those who were far off, those who were separated, have been brought near. Christ has removed the hostility between the sinner and God. He has removed the hostility between the, the Greek and the Jew. And he has created for himself one new person. If you like, the believer has been transformed from a sinner to a saint. That's the work of salvation. That's God's work. He has transformed you from a sinner to a saint. And Christ is building his church. Christ is the chief cornerstone. And as we contemplate and understand these amazing truths, Paul now turns to the practical. He turns to the practical. And these six verses that we have read could be broken into two easily understandable and identifiable uh, points. Verse 1 to 3, Paul is exhorting believers to have a, a proper attitude toward unity. 
And in verses 4 to 6, Paul illustrates how the Trinity, our triune God, serves as the basis for that unity. So let's just pick out a few things in, in these verses together. Start in verse 1. You can see this appeal from this, this apostle towards a church he loves deeply. You see this in the, in the very first couple of phrases. I therefore, that's a summary statement. We know what it's there. He's, he's summarizing the first three chapters as we've labored on previously. He says, I'm a prisoner for the Lord. That shows the location of Paul's writing. He is in prison. He is bound to a Roman guard. And yet, he writes this amazing letter of encouragement. And he urges the believers here in Ephesians to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now this word that we've translated urge is, is a strong appeal. It's an exhortation. It's an encouragement. Paul's not giving a mild encouragement here. Remember, he knows these people deeply. He serves with them. He loved them. He saw, that he saw them flourish in a, in a hedonistic city. He saw many of them come and, and burn their idols and their books for the sake of Christ. And here he, he urges them further. And he urges them about their lifestyle. He urges them about how their walk should be. And as mentioned earlier, this walk is both passive and active in nature. Passive because God provides the empowerment to do so, and active because you and I, or the Ephesian believers, have to take one step each day in the process of walking with God. You know, God continues to empower us by his grace. But I like to say, we've got to have some skin in the game here when it comes to our ongoing sanctification. On one side of the railway track, if you like, you can put it this way. On one side, you've got God's sovereignty. He provides the grace for our walk. He has prepared the good works beforehand. But on the other side of the train track, you've got man's responsibility. We've got to take the steps to walk in obedience to him. And you know, it's wonderful as you, you think about that particular picture of train tracks. The longer you walk with Christ... And the further you look down the tracks, it's amazing because those tracks seem to get closer and closer together. And there's a balance in the process. So that's what he's trying to explain here. He urges them, he exhorts them to walk in a manner that's worthy of what they have been called to and to whom has called them. To be worthy means to bring up the other beam of the scales. To be worthy means to balance an equilibrium. And that's the, I think, the, the thing here Paul is trying to balance for them. Understand that God is at work in your life understand that you need to bring into balance these things in obedience to him. And he explains that the, this mark of walking worthy is for those who are called to be his. It not only relates to the, the salvation an adoption by the Father, 
but also to the union we have as one body of the church. So therefore, this call for walking in a manner worthy is not just an individual call. It also refers not just to individual believers, even though that's an important uh, factor. It includes the corporate body known as the church. It is God who has called the Ephesians to relationship with him and it is God who will empower them in their walk. And the principle of unity starts flowing over this as we read verses 2 and 3 together. Because what describes what a worthy walk is? You may say, okay, well, okay, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer. How do I know I'm walking worthy? How do I know? It's a good question. How do I know I'm walking worthy individually and corporately in the body of Christ? I think verse 2 and 3 help us explain that. As they describe what a worthy walk is. Here it says, your walk is to be with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love. So you walk in a humble manner. To be humble is a, a contrast to being self-centered and proud. Remember God in his word has said, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humility is a gift of God's grace to the believer. You know, humility in our world is not considered a, a great virtue at all. And it's interesting, prior to New Testament times, this word never actually occurred in language. But here, Paul is saying, a worthy walk is a humble walk. Why? Because the opposite is a prideful work, walk. And what does pride do? Pride provokes disunity. Whereas humility promotes unity. See, pride will always stir up. Pride will always be the, the main characteristic of the arrogant. Pride will always push your agenda your way. And pride is counter humility. And who is the supreme example of humility? Christ himself, who humbled himself and became obedient as a servant under death. So humility naturally should be a hallmark of our walk. naturally be a hallmark of our walk. And the question there for you and I individually and as a, a, a church body, does humility, is humility of high importance to us all? If it's not, you will see a lot of disagreements, you'll see a lot of grumbling, you'll see a lot of complaining, you'll see a lot of fractions, you'll see a lot of disunity. And all those things are generally based on personal preference. You see, and, and that destabilizes the unity we should have as ambassadors of Christ. I can't answer that question for you, but I would ask that you do some heart surgery, if you like. And consider, am I a humble follower of Christ? And I'm talking false humility here. I'm talking a genuine humility. The one, a person who puts others' interests above themselves and serves God's people wholeheartedly. Think about that this week. Think about are you humble towards others within 
your church family. And you are, are you, the other harder one is, are you humble towards those who, who scoff and mock your beliefs? The next uh, aspect here is gentleness. So walk with humility and with gentleness. Gentleness, we know, is a fruit of the Spirit, and it is opposite to being rough. It should never be confused with the idea of weakness. And gentleness um, implies a, a conscious exercise of self-control, as opposed to the, the use of power for a purpose of retaliation. So self-control is another good word to, to think about as, as being gentle. And really only a person controlled by the Holy Spirit can truly be gentle. Once again, this is, this is something you can ask in your own heart. This was an instruction to, to these believers where there was a little bit of disunity going on, where there was a little bit of fraction between the uh, Greek Christians and the Jewish Christians about how they should operate. Gentleness was required. A self-control was required. It was, um, and this is something that we require in our own homes, in our own relationships, in our own church body. Once again, ask the Lord to develop this fruit of the Spirit in your own heart and life, a fruit of gentleness. The next one is patience. Another fruit of the Spirit. And I think in the context of this particular letter, this word patience is used for a person's endurance of grief. And it's a, a cautious endurance that does not abandon hope. It's just a little bit like a, a farmer who patiently waits for his crops to, crops to burst into life. You know, a farmer plants the seed, he waters the seed, he tends the weeds off the, off the uh, farm, but he's got to patiently wait for that seed to germinate and sprout. I think God is the greatest example of patience throughout the Old Testament when you see he, how he generously deals with the rebellious people time and time and time again. But for us, for you and I, for our, our walking in a manner worthy of our calling, walking in a manner that, that lines ourselves to who we are in Christ, patience doesn't abandon hope. It's a deep-seated endurance. So this would describe the manner of our walk, if you like. It's a, it's a, a, manner, of unity, a manner of humility, a manner of gentleness, and a manner of patience. And then we move into the means by which we should work, walk. That, uh, we should walk bearing one another in love. We should walk with eagerness to maintain the unity of spirit and the bond of peace. To bear one another in love, um, this is... This is a, a marvellous thing that the Christian church can display. It means a sense of tolerance, endurance, bearing up and putting up with. You know what it's like in a family, right? Sometimes we, we have to bear one another in love because some of the things that we do to one another inside a family unit just really, um, if we don't love, we would think we're enemies. You know, I think this uh, bearing one another in love has a reference to bearing up or enduring with respect to things or persons. And within the church setting, that means we're free to have differences. And this instructs us to tolerate those differences in love. As long as those differences aren't heresies, as long as those differences don't touch the the fundamental truths of the faith. We have tolerance towards one another in those matters. And we should have an eagerness to maintain the unity of the Spirit. 
to maintain is to keep, to preserve what is already in existence. See, when we come to faith in Christ, we automatically have a unity of the Spirit between ourselves and God and between ourselves and one another because the Spirit indwells us all. So this is not an establishment of something new, but rather an encouragement to keep and not lose or destroy something that's in our possession. And we can so often can destroy the unity of the Spirit. We can so often grieve the Spirit through our actions and through our disobedience. You know, here in this letter, this is a big thing because we had this fra fraction going on between the Christian Jews and the Christian Gentiles, even though they were united in one body, and they knew that. And Paul has explained how their lives, their walk, must be exemplified by humility, gentleness, patience, forbearing one another in love. And, and these characteristics and actions are present but also, as you read through it, you see it's been chipped away. You see, when these characteristics are present, all sorts of resentment is diffused, right? If we deal with one another with humility, gentleness, patience, and love, and with a desire to maintain the unity that we have in Christ, our resentments, our Bitternesses, our preferences will be diffused because our heart will be to walk in the Spirit, both individually and corporately, because that's what God is doing. If you go back to chapter 2, verse 22. Look at what he was saying to the Ephesian believers. He said this, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by his Spirit. He's reminding them in chapter 4 that this is the unity of the Spirit because God is building you together into a dwelling place where God's Spirit works. And this type of unity results in peace, and abiding together. As it says in the end of verse 3, use the Spirit in the bond of peace. Yeah, Paul was a prisoner. He knew what it meant to be bound. And now he's saying, I want you in the same way to be, to be bound together in the unity of the Spirit, pursuing these things, humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing one another up. As you read these, these lists of instructions, how do you measure up in these areas? I've been confronted by that this week. Is my walk a walk of humility? Is it a walk of gentleness? Is it a walk of patience? Do I eagerly want to maintain the unity of the Spirit or do I just want to have my own say? See, at the heart of these things, the origin of our unity is what God has done for us by indwelling us with his very Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the one that unifies. The Holy Spirit's the one who refines. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts us to prune away these things, to prune away our pride, our roughness, our intolerant intolerance. That's what the Spirit does. He, he, he grabs our lives and he, he prunes these things away so we can be unified. And we can walk by the Spirit. In Galatians, we have these wonderful instructions, and the NIV puts it this way, keep in step with the Spirit, Galatians 2.25. See, God for sure gives us the power, 
But we also have an element of responsibility. It's not this let go, let God mentality. We need to be obedient to the call of God on our lives. So this is the start of Paul's call. This is what it means to walk worthy. And, and then he gives a, a very quick example of the unity in the Trinity. Just briefly go through this. It's very simple to see. You've got seven ones there. Notice that. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. And he says this is here as a model of unity. Because God in Trinity is fully unified. Therefore, you as followers of Christ need also to be unified. Verse 4, you've got things relating to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the one that gives us one universal church, one body of, of Jews and Gentiles, no longer two entities, but one. The one Spirit is the one that provides access to God. You could read that in Ephesians 2, 16 to 22. And the Spirit also provides hope. Hope is the eager outworking of God's plan that all things will be consummated in Christ. Uh, chapter 1, verse 9. And although believers are presently seated with Christ in the future, they will be trophies of grace. Furthermore, the, the Spirit brings us and draws us near, united to one body in Christ. You see, hope for the Christian is the absolute certainty that God will deliver what he has promised. This hope is produced by God's call upon the believer's life. It's the Holy Spirit who regenerates the one body and provides the hope and certainty that God will fulfill his promises. And in the second verse, verse 5 there, we have Christ, who is the Lord, who provides redemption and hope and headship over the church and is the one in this context who unifies the Jew and Gentiles into one body. We have faith. This phrase seems contextually to be an objective faith because later in chapter 4 we have another a citing of it about talking about the unity of faith is tied to maturity and discernment. So I think one faith here is talking about a body of faith. Referring to the substance of a common body of belief. Much like a statement of faith. One baptism. I don't believe this is referring to water baptism or baptism by the Spirit. I think it's more like Romans 6 and it's a, a metaphor Paul is using uh, to talk about our union with Christ. Speaks in Romans 6 of our union with Christ and his death and resurrection, and it uses the, the term baptism. I think that fits well with this context here. And that's a key focus of unity. Because when we are baptized into Christ, it signifies our union with Christ. And this is, occurs at the time of our conversion, Romans 6 2 to 5. So. Verse 5 is talking about the second person of the Trinity. It talks about Christ who unifies believers in the unity of faith that matures and provides certainty that believers are united with Christ in his death and resurrection. And final part of the model is the Father. God the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This refers to God who is the Father of all believers. He's over all, he's through all, he's in all. God is supreme and transcendent. He's not only sovereign over all believers, but he works through all believers. He will accomplish his purposes through believers 
as we've seen in Ephesians 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship, his handiwork. And he will provide the power for us to, to walk in the good works which he has prepared beforehand for us. That shows his closeness to us, his imminence. So as you see in these six verses, you have a charge, you have an exhortation to, to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. You have the model of the Trinity itself. And when you start thinking about that concept of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, you see just a beautiful movement of unity. You see, the Father, if you look back at Ephesians 1, was active in the first moment or movement of salvation in electing and predestining us. The Son secures the second moment in redemption and forgiveness of sins. And the Spirit fills the third and fourth moments. He applies the redemption to us and regenerates us and serves as a guarantee of our future inheritance. Remember, this is salvation from God's perspective. And the triune God saves us in a unified relationship through Father, Son, and Spirit. And the same unity that is from eternity past in the Godhead should be represented as you and I walk and follow him. Robert hits the road, we are ambassadors of Christ. You put your faith and trust in him, you are an ambassador. And there are things that we should pay attention to. These things should always be fueled by our love for Christ. I just want to make that point time and time again. The reason we walk in a manner worthy of our calling is because we've been called, we've been transformed by the love of God. Our motivation and our affections of our heart are based on what God has done for us. Here it says, this, this love should be displayed, this walk should be displayed in unity towards one another, in humility, gentleness, with patience, maintaining the unity of the Spirit. It is an active responsibility and is empowered passively by God who provides his spirit. Unity is a hallmark of this walk because it reflects our triune God. The God who is over all, through all and in all, he does not leave us alone. He has prepared a place for us to walk. So then, this week, how will you walk? I'd encourage you to look at these traits. I would encourage you to, to ask others in your family, ask other believers, how am I doing in these things? Am I displaying humility, gentleness and patience? What disciplines are you putting in place? I know it's difficult at the moment as we are in isolation to, to have a disciplined lifestyle, but it's so important in the Christian life to be disciplined. If you want, that's the active part of walking, right? If you want to have victory over sin, if you want to have victory over the temptations that you face each day, remember who you are in Christ. Put the discipline around who you are in Christ and overcome the things that stop you from walking in the Spirit. As we go through the weeks ahead, we're going to unpack this even further and further and further because Paul goes into great detail about what each aspect of walking means and how we should respond. Let's just pray together. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for these clear and simple instructions that as followers 
of you, we are to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. Father, we stop and we reflect and we, we know at times we just do not. We know at times our, our hearts are far from your call on our lives. Father, we take time to repent of those things and we ask that you will refresh us anew to rely on your spirit to work in our hearts, to be patient, to be unified, to be humble, to bear one another in love, maintain the unity of the spirit. Father, oh, how your spirit must grieve when this unity is in the midst of us. We pray we will keep short accounts with you. And even in our times of isolation, our spiritual disciplines to, to thirst after the things that you want us to do will be a high priority. Enable us to, to be involved in reading your word daily, praying for one another, meditating upon your word, and encouraging one another, even though it's at a distance, with the things that you are teaching us through your word. We thank you for this time we can spend around your word today. We pray a blessing upon it now. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. As one of the uh, major marks of unity in the church, we get to share communion together. And Alan Blackton is going to lead us in communion now. Thanks, Alan. Well, welcome everyone to our communion time this morning. I trust that everyone's keeping safe and well. But in all of our isolation and things that we've been facing at present, I've been reflecting on what Nathan said last week in Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 10. We're going to have a look at that in a minute. If you've got your Bibles ready, you can follow in a second. But the point I want to make this morning is, uh, as Glenn has already pointed out, that we're all living in isolation at this particular time. And sometimes uh, that uh, the reading that we had for well, the reading that we have from Ephesians tells us that the uh, Ephesian church could have isolated themselves from God. So let's follow that through with uh, Ephesians two verses one to ten, and I'm reading from the NIV version. As for you, you are were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them who one time great gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and of following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest of we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, this, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared us in advance for us to do. I guess we've all been forced into separation from one another whilst we go through the COVID-19 crisis. To a greater extent, the, Egyptian, uh, the Ephesian church, or at least many of its members of the Ephesian church, had separated themselves from God by taking on or adopting pagan practices that did not honour God. However, Paul gives the Ephesian church a great news that comes from the obedience to God. In the second half of the reading, here was the means to overcome the separation from God that plagued the church. 
Presently, there was a continuing separation between modern society where many do not have faith in God and Christians who have faith in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. However, we read in Ephesians that God intervened in this human condition and transformed the situation that we all face. Though we're children of wrath, God acted out his divine mercy and of an abundance of love. God also acted out of divine mercy, even though many may not have been particularly lovable. God has made us alive in Christ, and he also raised us up with Christ. Today we come not in separation, but in unity as believers to celebrate this time of communion. It is time when we can thank God for the gift of his son who died for us upon the cross. It's time to thank God for the gift of grace that was freely given to all who believe and have faith in Jesus Christ. It's time to thank Christ for his selfless love. It's time to thank our Father for the hope that comes from the sacrifice of his one and only Son. Now we undertake a time of uh, sharing and communion. I'm going to have a short prayer for the bread, which in which case people can then uh, partake of the bread, then a short prayer for the cup, and we'll share with the cup together. So shall we pray. Father, and even in these difficult times, we know that uh, you are always in control, and we, we thank you for your son that uh, died for us upon the cross. We know that his body was broken for us so that we, we could go in hope of uh, joining him in the kingdom to come. And now, Father, we bless that you bless this bread that we share together. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. We take the bread and we share. Now, Father, we, we ask that you bless us as we consider the time that uh, Jesus died for us upon the cross and that his blood was shed for all, everyone who believed in him, that that blood was shed to wash away the sins of this particular world and also the sins of not only myself, but everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we take the, the cup and drink? Now that ends our time of uh, communion. Um, just a reminder that uh, a part of our worship is, uh, is the act of giving. Uh, we have a church that uh, needs to continue to function. We have uh, things to pay for and uh, all of those sorts of things. We ask that uh, if you haven't already done so, that you uh, look at uh, joining up through the electronic funding transfer system or if you like, you can drop your, dropping, uh, drop your offerings off to church, the church office on Mondays and Wednesdays to Chris. As we finish our service today, we now uh, join together in singing our final song, None But Jesus.
Thanks, church family, for joining us uh, today. We trust it's been a, an encouragement and a blessing to you. Hope you've enjoyed that final song, None But Jesus. Now, just in closing, let, let's, um, let's make sure this week we, we contact somebody we haven't contacted yet. Uh, get on the phone to, to have a chat to somebody in the church body that you haven't chatted to for some time. Trust that will be an encouragement to you. Um, at the end of the service, there will be some contact information for, for you if, you if you need some prayer or yeah, just someone to talk through, the, through this uh, difficult time. Both myself and Danny and uh, Logan are available to chat. So thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. Blessings to you all. Thanks. <laughs>